I'm going to make it very quick. Um, as I said in my uh, written comments, I think it's very important. Good. I see recording. Thank you. Um, moving forward, I want to be very quick um, on the budget comments that the only things I really think should be um, a focus, because I take CEO Heath at his word that, that the agency scrubbed their budget, um, is that um, I really think board members and board alternates, as well as all community transit employees should get a transit pass for their service. Uh, being a board member is a very difficult job, a lot of hours of reading, a lot of hours of reading correspondence, a lot of hours of checking social media for um, reactions. And, um, you know, it, it just, I think, should be properly compensated. And I also want to see more board members take transit to get around and make a system that works for all, all the citizens. Long term, as we recover, I would like to see conversations about um, maybe having at least disabled veterans get transit free passes. I am not a veteran, but I respect those who serve. And I would like to believe that I support our troops. And just as one government in uh, our Pacific Northwest is giving free parking to veterans, I think our response should be strategic and say, okay, we're going to give free uh, riders passes to veterans or at least disabled veterans as the budget allows. I hope my comments were succinct and clear. And again, I appreciate the recording. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. We appreciate it. And um, with that, I'll open it up to anybody else in the audience who wishes to speak to this public hearing on the 2021 proposed budget. Is there anybody else? One last time, anybody else on the budget? Okay. We will close the public hearing on the budget then. And um, with that, we will go to public comment in general. And so, again, we have one individual who signed up to speak under public comment. Uh, and I will open the floor to Mr. Kunzler to speak. And then after that, we'll ask if there's anybody else. So, Mr. Kunzler, uh, under general public comment, uh, the floor is now yours. Thank you for letting me roll in hot. Um, I took, um, you know, my first comment is on legislative priorities. Um, I understand that's being worked on. And so I want to give my comments now so it's done and over with. I um, really am supportive of this agency. I am, a, quite frankly, of the view that I think we should just declare victory on um, online meetings, keep things the way they are, give all community transit staff recognition for that work, all. I don't want to play favorites or any of that stuff, but I think all the staff have really been through a, a challenge since March, technologically, psychologically, to get here. And I think it's worth publicly thanking all staff, not just a certain individual whose birthday is this month, 35th, 35th birthday is this month. And also, um, it's important to recognize CEO Heath. It's important to recognize all the staff. And, and I really hope that uh, and I really, I, I really cannot stress this enough. I really hope you guys will ask the legislature to allow you to continue in online meetings, or at least hybrid meetings. And um, really, really stress that these meetings provide for more civility. And if there was more advertising of these meetings, I would dare say, such as more tweeting, Instagramming, Facebooking, you know, TikToking, whatever platforms you can use, you'd have more diverse public input than one white male dude. Um, and I really want to stress that uh, as well, that with a sound train, I understand CU Rogoff is going to present. I've tried to reach out to him as well about this. And the special reason why I'm calling him out with all due respect is that, um, and this is my tribute to CEO Heath as well, is I think CEO Heath cares a lot more for the employees of community transit than the CEO of sound transit about his, because whenever there's an issue, CEO Heath is on the horn to me within hours saying this is a problem, this is an issue. And um, I, I've tried to reach out to CEO Rogoff down in South Transit about some of the out of control behavior that goes on in that boardroom. 
and have not gotten a response and I'm very critical of that. I, I don't think we need to have Nazi salutes and other stuff at public meetings. So I think having the attorney general's office give model rules on public meetings would be helpful to all of you. I, I cannot stress enough how grateful I am for all of your public service and for the hard work the community transit staff collectively has done to get us here to online meetings. It is hard work and it is commended. And I wanna wish any staffer who has a November birthday, a happy birthday with a special birthday picture. Happy birthday and thank you for your service. Thank you, Mr. Kunzler. I appreciate that. Um, is there anybody else in the audience who wishes to speak under public comment? Okay, one last call. Anybody on public comment? Okay, thank you. That brings us to presentations, and uh, this is always a special one. We generally obviously do this in person, which uh, uh, is always a lot of fun, but I'm appreciative of staff putting together, I think, a very creative way to do this uh, via Zoom. And so, CEO Heath, I'm going to turn it over to you, and I think you and I will collectively kind of walk, work our way through this. I think you're on mute. Yeah, we will. This uh, another tag team as we go through a fun presentation for this year's cycle of our Van Gogh grant program. A couple of other fun presentations coming up. Of course, uh, CEO Rogoff will be here to provide an update on sound transit and uh, also great ridership report from our research analytics and data division later on. But first, um, at Community Transit, our vision is to make travel easy for all. Our mission is to help people get from where they are to where they want to be. With that in mind, there are a variety of ways uh, that we, we strive to make transportation easy for everyone. And this Van Gogh grant program is a very special and unique effort on our part to help do that. Today, I'm really pleased uh, to have some of our grant, uh, our surplus van pool vehicles going to nonprofit organizations in Snohomish County. They will use these vans to improve access to transportation for all of the residents and people that they serve. I wanna welcome uh, all of the recipients of the van grants who are calling in today. I'd like to ask them all now to go ahead, if they would please turn their cameras on, uh, turn, their, uh, turn their cameras on so we can see them and we'll get on with the presentations. This is Community Transit's 15th Van Gogh vehicle grant cycle since we began this program in 2000. Uh, since that time, we have granted 146 vehicles to nonprofit organizations in our community. This year, we'll grant an additional 12, 15 passenger vans. Each of the recipient organizations provides a valuable and necessary service to our community. And the groups will use these vehicles to provide support and transportation, which will improve the lives of citizens in our community and especially those who are served by these 501c3 charitable organizations. Chair Nearing, over to you. Let's get this started off. Thank you. Uh, as we're both things here in 2020, our ceremony will, of course, look a little different this year. We can't call our groups up to honor them in person, which is traditionally what we do. But we are excited to have you here with us virtually. The work you do to support our community is really inspiring. And on behalf of the Community Transit Board, I want to take a moment to thank you. Emmett and I will take turns sharing some background about each organization who will be awarded here today uh, a Van Gogh vehicle. The first one, Angel Resource Connection. Angel Resource Connection directly assists unsheltered individuals in securing housing while also providing meals, clothes, hygiene kits, winter survival, backpacks, and often a phone and preloaded Orca card to reach these services. Angel Resource Connection will util utilize the Van Gogh vehicle they receive to transport vulnerable adults and families to these essential services on the spot. Uh, what a tremendous uh, uh, asset this is for our community and we want to thank Angel Resource Connection for all they do. Second is uh, Edmonds Church of God. The Edmonds Church of God operates the Night Watch Ministry, organizing monthly community volunteer events to feed the homeless. 
Edmonds Church of God will organize a volunteer-driven band ministry to assist their youth and their aging members to get themselves and others where they need to go. We're very happy to support such a worthy cause as that. Third, uh, before I turn it over to Leo uh, Heath, is First Class Association of Washington State. First Class Association of Washington State works with refugees, immigrants, senior and vulnerable citizens, including the homeless. First Class Association of Washington State will utilize a Van Gogh van to provide transportation to and from medical appointments and employment services. And what a great service that is. Thank you for all that you do. And with that, I'll turn it over to our CEO. Thank you. And uh, next up is the Gambian Talents Promotion. Gambian Talents Promotion works to bridge the gap between Gambians and our wider community. Gambian Talents Promotion will utilize their van, to uh, their vehicle to help their clients remove uh, transportation as a barrier to being able to access employment and, and essential services in our community. And next, we have a longstanding uh, charitable organization from Snohomish County, the Greater Trinity Academy. A longtime acquaintance of mine, Dr. Paul Stutes, the leader at uh, GTI. I don't know if Dr. Stutes is with us today, but certainly I'm sure he would be in spirit. Uh, GTI offers in-person learning and transportation to families, including children of essential workers who reside within the Muckleteo and Everett School Districts. The Greater Trinity Academy and the Greater Trinity Church will to get work together to fully utilize this Van Gogh vehicle to support the education center, their church, and their community outreach. Congratulations to GTI and Dr. Stutes. Next up is the Korean Community Service Center. The Korean Community Service Center promotes the health and well being of the Korean American community within Snohomish County through education, support services, advocacy, and community building. The Korean Community Service Center will be able to immediately utilize this van to provide transportation to low income seniors and individuals with disabilities to reach the essential services like medical appointments, grocery shopping, health and wellness classes, and citizenship clinics. Congratulations to the Korean Community Service Center. Chair Nearing, back to you. Thank you. Next, we have the Latino Education Training Institute. And the Latino Education Training Institute serves the un underrepresented, underrepresented, excuse me, Latino community here in Snohomish County to help bring language appropriate assistance and help their neighbors achieve stability. This includes both financial and mental stability. The Latino Education Training Institute will be able to immediately utilize their Van Gogh van to provide transportation to language appropriate safety workshops, to adult general education, conversational English, financial literacy and wellness classes. They'll also include outreach events as well as providing emergency transportation when that is needed. Thank you for that. Next, Millennium Ministries, and they have a mission to end homelessness by providing crisis transition and permanent supportive housing and addressing and preventing food insecurity by empowering women, single mother families, and others in need with material support, educational resources, referrals to programs, and compassion. Millennium Ministries <clears throat> will quickly utilize their van to provide transportation of volunteers to food events and grocery handouts, perform homeless outreach and provide transportation for emergency hotel stays. And next is the Monroe Gospel Women's Mission. The Monroe Gospel Women's Mission provides temporary housing to adult, disabled, pregnant and at need women. The Monroe Gospel Women's Mission will be able to immediately use their Van Gogh van to provide transportation to food banks, education classes, grocery shopping, medical appointments, housing appointments, and hospitals for childbirth. And that's the three great recipients. And back over to you, CEO Heath. I think you're on mute. Darn, first time since March. <laughs> right. <laughs> 
All right, next up, North Snohomish County Outreach. North Snohomish County Outreach helps people experiencing homelessness or who are living in poverty in North Snohomish County get to the basic services like laundry, medical appointments, job interviews, and shelter. North Snohomish County Outreach will be able to immediately utilize this vehicle to put transportation, to provide transportation to cold weather shelters, medical services, behavioral health appointments, employment interviews, and many other programs that they provide services for. Congratulations and thank you very much to the North Snohomish County Outreach. Next up is the North Sound Church. North Sound Church operates a parish health program which allows them to offer assistance to seniors to operate a children's and youth program where they hold several supply and food drives for local schools and other nonprofits, as well as volunteer programs like Northwest Harvest and Nourishing Network. The North Sound Church will be able to utilize this van almost immediately to transport their volunteers to, um, to, to food sites uh, and to supply th their food drives, they'll provide a shuttle service from off-site parking and transport seniors to necessary medical and dental appointments. And our last awardee of the day is the YMCA of Snohomish County. The YMCA of Snohomish County offers school-aged children and early education care programs. They provide homework support, social outreach, and healthy living programs. The YMCA of Snohomish County will be able to use this van to transport volunteers to assist them with the many, many programs that they operate, as well as those in, partner uh, in partnership with other organizations in Snohomish County. Congratulations to the YMCA of Snohomish County. Congratulations to all of the recipients today. Um, I want you to know that we uh, greatly appreciate the support that all of you provide within our uh, community. We're very proud to um, assist you by granting these vehicles to you. Um, thank you. And, and I wanna give us a little shout out, a staff shout out to our Vanpool coordinator, Kristen Ryan. You know, none of this, this stuff uh, looks so easy by the time we get to this level, but there is a tremendous amount of background work that our staff uh, handles to arrange and, and implement this program. So Kristen, thank you very much for your efforts to organize this. And with that, uh, congratulations again to the recipients that completes our Van Gogh grant award cycle for this year. Back to you, Chair. Thank you for that very much appreciated and uh, again always a fun part of what we do um and with that i believe we are going to go to the do we have our ceo from sound transit uh peter rogoff on i'm hoping you can see me yeah, there we are perfect well thank you for joining us uh we very much appreciate it we're looking forward uh here and i'll turn it over to first of all the ceo heath to properly introduce you yeah great <clears throat> Great, anxious for you all to have an opportunity to hear uh, Peter in just a moment, but uh, Peter has been up to provide updates to this board previously. It has been a while and, and during that uh, intervening period, we have several new board members. So I'd like to start out by providing a little bit of a, an introduction about our relationship with Sound Transit. I'll introduce Peter and, and then turn it over to him. Uh, first of all, Peter, uh, thank you. We really appreciate you coming up here this afternoon. Also with Peter is Cameron Garal. Cameron is the North Corridor Department Director for Sound Transit, and Arish Ashley Vinke, who is their Government and Community Relations Manager in the North Corridor. Um, as you know, I think most of you know, Sound Transit contracts with Community Transit to provide express commuter service. Um, through this contract, we help move people from Snohomish County to East King County, um, to Seattle, and back home again every day. We've been doing this with Sound Transit since 1999, and over the years, our agencies have developed a very close and a very productive partnership. We also uh, share a board member. Uh, Mayor Nicola Smith from Linwood serves uh, on our board. She also serves on the Sound Transit Board. She also runs one of the largest cities in Snohomish County. Uh, Mayor Smith, thank you for doing double duty. 
We have been uh, talking a lot in recent years about the transformation that we'll experience when light rail comes to Snohomish County in 2024. At your October uh, workshop, you received a briefing about the build out of Community Transit's SWIFT BRT network and the reconfiguration of our local services to connect to Link Light Rail at their stations at Shoreline, Mount Lake Terrace, and Linwood. And later today, you'll be taking action on a service proposal to connect uh, Link Light to Link Light Rail at Northgate next year. Our two agencies are very highly coordinated on these activities, as well as a variety of other programs and projects at a staff and leadership level. Peter Rogoff leads uh, that engagement between our two agencies and Community Transit could not have asked for a better partner. Also want to uh, shout out to Cameron Garral, who is very highly regarded here as the North Corridor Development Director, working on a very frequent basis uh, with our staff on North Corridor Developments. Had the opportunity to know Peter for five years and get to know him a little bit better during that period. Uh, we both serve as members of a group we call the Mobility Partnership. You hear me refer to the Mo Mobility Partnership from time to time. It's a group of transportation leaders that uh, coordinate uh, on regional transportation issues. Um, and I, I've come to really value the partnership, uh, the opportunity that we have for dialogue between the key transportation leaders uh, in the region. And now for Peter, uh, before, uh, as I say, most of you know Peter well, some of you uh, perhaps not so well. Let me tell you just a little bit about his background. Before coming to Sound Transit, uh, Peter served as the Under Secretary of Transportation for Policy in the US Department of Transportation. And before that, as US Federal Transit Administrator from 2009 to 2014. Combined with 22 years on the staff of the Senate Appropriations Committee, I think it's fair to say that his experience and knowledge of federal grants and policy is unrivaled in this region, and it has proven to be an enormous asset, not only for Sound Transit, but for all of us in this region. Peter, thanks for taking time to be up here with us today. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you for your presentation to our board. Thanks again. Well, thank you, Emmett, and, and thank you to the board for having us today. Uh, and I really, I really want to emphasize before I get into the meat of the presentation, um, something that Emmett said, and that is <clears throat> the taxpayers of the region expect us to be coordinated, uh, all of our agencies. We're all trying to serve um, a universe of passengers that runs all the way for sound transit purposes all the way, you know, as, as far north as Everett, Everett and as far south as DuPont and as far east as Issaquah. Um, and we really, I think, have, have taken it to a new level in the last couple of years in terms of our level of coordination and our levels of integration and the extent to which we just view the region as a series of riders that we're all duty bound to try to serve efficiently and not in a duplicative fashion. And I think that was really proven, you know, when COVID hit and we were all, you know, facing a crisis in terms of operationally, financially, we were talking on the phone three times a week. It's now down to once a week. We're getting down to, I think now once every other week. But those conversations and just and just making sure that we were all uh, fully cognizant of what everyone else was seeing and hearing and acting accordingly and ideally acting in sync uh, was really, really important. And now as we're all collectively trying to plan service levels in a constrained financial environment, we're doing it again. We are really looking and saying, all right, how do we best serve with everyone else's financial constraints how do we best serve uh, those partners? We've got situations, we just briefed, in fact, Nicholas Smith uh, serving uh, on both boards just heard a presentation of service changes that we are proposing to make and how we're going to uh, best serve folks in the North Quarter through a combination of community transit bus trips and sound transit bus trips for those who want to take a one seat ride into Seattle versus those who want to change at Northgate when it opens. Um, and it, that was only possible because of our really careful coordination. 
and, and I'll, I'll state the obvious, and that is the tone for that kind of cooperation and coordination is set by the top. And Emmett has been really a, an ideal partner for us in, in tackling these things. I was not here for those years, but I do know from past lore that the relationship with community transit was not always so great a decade or so ago. Um, but um, that it, it really could not have, have been more ideal. And, and we are not just a partner, but, but to, since community transit operates our bus service, I always remind people, you know, those community transit drivers are our hands and feet about how we touch our passengers. Um, and, uh, and I've had lost not a moment of sleep thinking that we cared more about that service than, than Emmett did. Um, so thank you. And I'm, I'm just very sorry to lose him. Um, and, and Christmas will be bittersweet for us <laughs> uh, as he steps off. I'm going to go through a bunch of slides and hopefully have time for some questions. I'm going to go through them relatively quickly so we can. Um, and it's really about just sort of where Sound Transit is at now. But importantly, uh, Mayor Smith will have to see some slides maybe for the seventh time here in terms of where we are heading in terms of uh, our capital program and how we're dealing with the recession uh, that is accompanying the pandemic. So you want to go to the next slide? Keep going. Um, you know, where are we on service? We obviously just like CT reduced to really essential services um, in, in March and April. Services has begun to, to come back. We added more service in July and and we're now seeing pa uh, passenger counts starting to, to come back, depending on the service that we're talking about, whether it's like traditional commuter service like Sounder that runs commuter rail, obviously down uh, from Everett. Edmonds Muckleteo uh, to Seattle, um, that might be off more closer to 90% while certain bus routes might be off only about 70%, but roughly our, our ridership like so many other transit agencies is between 70 and 90% down. Next slide. You know, this is a very important slide because we always assume that people kind of know who we are and um, certainly Mayor Smith does and, and many of you do because I've, I've liaised with a number of you but I think this is really important to just talk about what the vision is and what did the voters endorse in ST in Sound Move and ST2 and ST3, and it is as we're, we 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 are fond of saying the the largest transit expansion program in the United States, uh, with and and really even with our financial challenges as you'll see in a subsequent slide, we are full speed ahead to the north, east, and south. Uh, with big and fully funded improvements coming uh, in the next three years. Um, this sort of lays out uh, our multiple modes and the number of miles and expansions that's there. But, you know, in, in the final end, uh, toward the end of the plan, we will have light rail all the way out to Issaquah, all the way up to Everett, uh, uh, commuter rail all the way down to DuPont, and a bus rapid transit line going around 405 and 522. Let me go to the next slide. This is a really, you know, because of this discussion about the fact that we have to slow down um, potentially parts of our capital program, it becomes like the Debbie Downer that consumes the room. And we feel really, it's very important to remind everyone this that you see on this page, you know, as you can see, we are in major construction on seven very large projects, and these are not being subjected to any reduction or any slowdown. We are on construction on all of them. I'm sure, I'm sure many of you have been up and down I-5. You know, you, 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 you don't, if you don't do it for three days, you're seeing dramatic changes in terms of the heavy civil construction work going on with Linwood Link along I-5. Uh, Mayor Smith and I just toured Congressman Larson um, around the site uh, just to show him uh, what progress is being made. And we will be you know, rolling out a major improvement every year for the next three years until in 2024 when we'll, we'll roll out three. So Northgate will open next year. Our extension of the small light rail uh, service down in Tacoma will actually then uh, be much larger than it is currently and will be much more viable in serving residential communities, the medical facilities in Tacoma Dome. That will open in 2022. Eastlink will open to, to 2023. That will be 10 stations opening overnight. 
from you know Seattle, Mercer Island, Bellevue, and out to the Microsoft campus. And then in 2024, we will open the Linwood Federal Way and the next two stations out to downtown Redmond, all anticipated in 2024. And that is fully funded. It's not subject to realignment. Uh, parenthetically, we are also almost close to opening up a new maintenance facility in Bellevue to handle that capacity. And we're in construction on a parking garage in Puyallup. Um, so there, th this will be a very viable and useful network running you know, as far south as Federal Way, as far north as Linwood, as far east as, as Bellevue and Redmond. And it's funded and it's happening. And there's, there's a lot to celebrate here even as we uh, take a look at uh, where we might have to uh, uh, trim our sails because of the recession. Next slide. This is just a further uh, elaboration of what we can expect um, when we're um, uh, in, in Snohomish County. As you can see, uh, light rail is funded not just up to Everett, but via the, the job center at, at Payne Field. Um, what I think is, is important to show about this is um, we will also be interlining with, and you see that that Linwood Transit Center, uh, which really we have done a lot of work with Mayor Smith and her staff on reimagining a lot of the street grid that gets buses in and out of Linwood. As you know, as, as community transit board members, the goal is to cease having community transit buses go out of county um, by 2024 with a remarkable amount of interlining bus passengers to uh, light rail at Linwood in 2024. Um, and uh, this is, you know, with in combination with uh, our sounder service where the, uh, the one of our board committees just extended the operating agreement for Sounder North for another couple of decades. Um, there, there's gonna be a lot of high capacity options. Um, and it's also gonna free up obviously resources for community transit to use. Uh, to expand the SWIFT network. Uh, next slide. This is one I'm particularly proud of because it really goes to the integration. This identifies where all of our light rail stops are expected to be as we build out the system and all of the SWIFT BRT lines that interline directly to those stations. Um, and this is how we really provide an accessible service. Uh, we, <laughs> we can't do it without you and have no desire to. Um, this is how we really maximally serve our uh, the, the passengers. I always need to remind people, you know, your, their passengers are ours and our passengers are theirs. And, you know, the beauty of all of our buses being painted blue and white is there's some percentage of the ridership who don't know what service they're on, and that's fine. So, next slide. So this is where we are on, on what you'll hear mention of on the realignment process. Obviously, the recession, uh, like so many other transit agencies, has had a real hit on us. Um, right now, I would say, I don't want to say the best case scenario, but if it's only a moderate recession, our financial plan will be off by $6 billion. If it has a severe recession on the par, on a par of what we, we went through in 2009, uh, it could be as much as $12 billion. Uh, Obviously, it is extraordinarily hard to predict how long um, the, the economy will suffer and our revenues will suffer as a result. Um, but as has happened, and as the board went through in 2010, the board really right after ST2 passed in 2008, the Sound Transit Board had to take a fresh look at our capital plan to make it affordable based on new revenue projections from the recession uh, of, of that period. And we're about to embark on uh, the same process going forward. Next slide. So what are our near-term priorities? Well, the first I've already mentioned, we're gonna stay building what we're building and all, everything that's under contract and under construction is fully funded and is gonna happen. Pretty much every other capital project on, the, uh, um, on our program needs to be reviewed uh, and, and considered for realignment. Um, and the goal you'll see in a, in a schedule is for the board to really kick this off in earnest in January with the goal of completing it in July. Next slide. This is uh, an important slide. The board charged us with evaluating each of the capital projects through a set of criteria, uh, eight criteria to be uh, exact. Five of these criteria were identical to the criteria that was used in the development of the ST3 plan but three are new. 
um, and I'll identify ridership potential uh, was was part of the ST3 plan. Socioeconomic equity was part of the ST3 plan, but I think it goes without saying that in the current day and with the heightened focus on this area, I'm sure that we will be evaluating data in a more granular form than we did back in, in, in uh, 2014 and 15 when the ST3 plan was put together. Connecting centers, obviously uh, a very important criteria also from the ST3 plan. The issue of tenure, how long have voters been waiting for the project? That is new and was added uh, by the board for this process. Uh, the ability to get outside funding, obviously any, anything that we could get built, perhaps through a federal stimulus bill or other sources that may, um, that, that was a new, uh, a new criterion that was added for this process. Completing the spine, obviously sort of uh, fundamental to our, our goals as an agency, and that, that has been a goal of the agency for some time, including SC3, SD2, and before. And advancing logically beyond the spine was also from ST3. Uh, I direct your attention to the last one, phasing compatibility. This is a tool that's used by a number of, of transit agencies, and that is what, what is sometimes referred to as a minimum operable segment. If you can't afford to build the whole thing all at once, would you build and would it be economical and make sense to build farther in any one direction um, with the goal of having a second operable segment to get to you know, the final terminus of the line? And I suspect that that's gonna be looked at as an option for a variety of the lines so we can continue to make progress um, and get people on high capacity transit sooner in their journey. Um, and and more to come on that when when we roll out our findings to the board in January. Next slide. So what are the principal tools that the board has at its disposal? Well, one that's been used before is just delaying uh, the completion of the project. The challenge really comes down to um, uh, the uh, we have to manage against our debt capacity, and I, I didn't populate all the slides that show those charts. Another is to actually modify a project scope. Um, can we you know, have the kind of scope discipline where we can get more uh, transit for the buck? Another, another dynamic that we're unfortunately not yet seeing. We were in a very, very hot construction market before COVID hit. We would kind of hope that in a recession that pricing might come down from our contractor uh, community. We frankly aren't seeing any evidence of that yet, but you know, back in 2008 and 2000, well, 2009 and 2010, Sound Transit was really one of the only major capital constructors that were still hiring people off the bench, and we want to continue to do that through this uh, through this recession. But the other uh, issue was uh, we were also getting better prices that allowed us to continue to make progress even in lean economic times. And if we could secure external funding, um, that would be a way that uh, you know we have a fairly modest assumption on federal funds, for example, for this uh, for our plan. We have been outperforming those to date. If, if whether the current administration or a new administration um, was to come in and, and really have an infrastructure bill that would pump additional dollars for major capital construction, we would want to be part of that uh, to 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 help move projects forward. Next slide. So this is the schedule. Um, there's obviously gonna be an external stakeholder engagement component in the spring where we will bring to the public what, you know, not only the criteria reads that we, we gave them, but also a um, allow the public to give us their input on some of these trade-offs uh, with the goal, as I said, of the board completing the project uh, process in July. Now, you know, somewhere in here, obviously, uh, it's extraordinarily hard to predict precisely what our financial envelope will be between now and 2041. It's a difficult thing to do in normal times. Uh, but at some point, we're going to have to uh, come to closure on what we think the likely financial envelope is going to be and try to manage against that. We always, every year, we reconsider what our financial envelope looks like uh, we bring a new financial plan to the board, which is really a set of projections. And as happened in the recession from 2008 and 9, certain projects got slowed down. And when the economy improved, 
we came back to the board and say, we now have the financial capacity to restart those projects. Um, and, you know, uh, ideally this, that, that, that process will repeat itself. Next slide. So that's where we are on realignment. You know, I guess I would leave you two takeaways. It's gonna be a difficult process. It's gonna be a very transparent process. I mean, we like community transit, all of our board meetings are online. All of the materials that we hand out to the board are available to the public. Um, I would encourage you, obviously uh, Mayor Smith is dual hatted and, and can serve as liaisons, but you, you shouldn't hesitate to contact us directly with questions and there'll be a huge amount of material available um, either through, um, through Eric, if you wanna to get to Eric or, or look on our website. Uh, I, I would really encourage you to check in with us on what's really going on. Whenever there are these difficult processes where hard decisions are being made and one project is viewed as being pitted against another, there is a high likelihood of misinformation that goes out out there. We would like to beat that down and be as clear with everyone about, you know, the goal is to finish what we started to meet the commitments that we made to the voters. Uh, it may have to be in a different order and a different timeline based on, on a, a new financial picture, but that's happened before and we've always continued to make progress. So thanks for your time. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, uh, very informative. And are there any questions um, from the board? Trying to scroll through here and make sure I'm looking. Go ahead and speak up if you have any. And if not, I wanna thank you CEO Rogoff for uh, the informative discussion and taking the time to come and join us here at our board meeting today. Thanks for your time, appreciate it being here. Great. Uh, Chair, I'd, I'd also like to close with a thank you to Peter for coming up. Also, Cameron Garal was uh, here with Peter along with Eric, Eric Ashley Vinky, uh, we, uh, all of whom we work with on a regular basis. So uh, thanks for all of, uh, to all of you for coming up to do this today. Um, Peter, I want to I want to tell you it's uh, it's been a good ride. I have really enjoyed working with you in Sound Transit. You said you thought the relationship had come a long ways over the past few years. I, I couldn't agree more. It'll be a point of pride for me when I look back, uh, when I reflect on uh, my career, that there could be such a strong relationship between two important partners bringing these services to our citizens. So bittersweet indeed, but um, thanks very much. And uh, it's, as I say, good ride. Yeah. Take care. Send, Take care. Send, send us postcards from the beach. Will do. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, and we do have one more presentation on the Q3 ridership. Director Behe, do you want to introduce that? Sure. I will. Sure. Uh, oh, Behe. Yeah, I'll turn this over to Roland. It's his, it's his uh, presentation. <laughs> I'm I'm on mute. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to briefly, uh, I want to introduce Olivia Woods, who manages our research and analytics, analytics division, uh, RAD, or RAD, as we like to call them. Uh, before we get to Olivia's presentation, I just want to take a moment to highlight this group to the board. Um, you're aware we've established an agency priority around innovation and improving products and services. Um, there's a key part of that strategy. Uh, that involves developing an industry best practice research capability um, that proactively looks for opportunities to innovate and improve. And that's through um, looking outward uh, to, um, to customers and uh, to partner agencies, peers in the industry. Um, also looking inward um, in terms of efficiency, effectiveness, and key performance indicators that for us help to inform a cycle of development, testing, and improvement. And Olivia and her group have been building this research capability in close partnership with um, other parts of the company in uh, information technology operations, customer experience, and others. And their work has really been instrumental, particularly in recent months, um, in helping us track ride, changing ridership, uh, the loads on vehicles, customer perceptions during the pandemic. And you've seen some of that work over the past few months. Today, Olivia is gonna be sharing our most recent quarterly ridership results and some uh, contextual comparisons as well to other transits across the state. And this is uh, part of our regular cycle of um, updating the board on performance on the system. And so with that, um, Olivia, I'll hand this over to you. Awesome, thanks for that rad introduction, Roland. 
Uh, and good afternoon, everybody. Nice to meet you. Um, as Roland said, I'm going to walk you all through the 2020 third quarter ridership report. So get ready for a lot of numbers. Uh, oh, next. I don't have control. Uh, we're going to start off just looking at the system boarding. So system, we're looking at all of our service types at Community Transit. And you can see these here stacked up on these bar graphs. That dark blue is our regular bus service. And then right above that is our BRT Swift service. And above that in purple is Vanpool service. And above that is our DART paratransit service. So we're looking at a comparison of year to date, January to September of each of these years. And so if you're looking along the X axis of that bar graph, we have 2018, 2019, and 2020. And you'll see from 2018 to 2019, we had an overall increase of 3% in our ridership. And you'll notice that that light blue bar, the SWIFT BRT bus rapid transit service uh, had the majority of that increase, a 27% jump from the previous year. Um, a lot of that is attributed to our launch of the SWIFT Green Line in March of that year. Looking at how 2020 is stacking up, um, not a huge surprise here. We had a reduction in service, pretty dramatic. Uh, we went down from 8.23 million by the end of September of 2019 to 4.61 million in this year. So almost a 50% reduction. Um, our DART paratransit service was reduced by 61%. That was our highest hit um, service, followed by Vanpool at 54% decline and our bus service at 53% decline. So our BRT service, our SWIFT, is only down 7%. And there's really two reasons for that. Um, one of it is that we have all that extra SWIFT green um, data in there uh, that we didn't have at the beginning of 2019. So we've got all the ridership that was at normal levels from January and February and mid-March. Um, and then additionally, um, which we'll kind of look at later, our SWIFT service has really been pretty resilient, um, more so than our other services. Um, so we saw uh, less of a decline specifically in SWIFT. Uh, next slide. So now we're going to just jump into individual modes, and I'm going to talk about three. We have fixed route, which is going to be regular bus plus Swift combined, and then Vanpool and then Dart. Next slide. So here's fixed route. Now um, we're looking at uh, changes by quarter. So when we're looking at the colors on this graph, the bottom, the dark blue is a quarter one, and then right above that quarter two, and then quarter three at the top. And then 2018 and 2019 are still showing quarter four in that light green. So you'll see um, that we did see that percent increase from 2018 to 2019 and um, very dramatically different from what we're seeing in 2020. Um, our first quarter, we were down uh, 4%, not too bad. And that's again, because we had that extra swift ridership in there. Um, but then quarter two, uh, we got hit our hardest um, in April. That's when we saw our lowest ridership month. And then um, we started to have a kind of steady increase, a slow, uh, consistent increase, but then it's, it's really leveled off and we've been pretty consistent for a while. So um, that quarter three, you see that slight recovery and, um, and we were only down by about 57% for that quarter. Next slide. So looking at this by day type, we kind of have different customer bases depending on the days of that we're providing service. Uh, we saw our biggest um, decline in ridership for weekdays um, at 46% down, and then 23% down for Saturdays, and only 13% down for Sundays. And a lot of this can really be uh, attributed to our commuter service. It's only operating on weekdays, and it was hit um, especially hard during the pandemic as most of those customers are able to work from home and were instructed to do so from their employers. Um, and obviously that commuter service is not operating on the weekends. Next slide. Okay, so I put this slide in here to just kind of show you how community transit fixed route service has been trending over time. This uh, graph shows you data all the way back to 2014 through um, current information. And so what's pretty cool about it is that these years are really ranked um, by the light, the darkness of gray. So 2014 is that light gray at the very bottom. And then it gets darker and darker as it goes towards the top uh, with 2019 at the very top. And uh, I know I'm in a presentation. Can you go up there, please? Thank you. Um, so uh, what's really great to see is that each year it really is that increase year over year trend. Uh, and 2020 was on track to be no different. 
you can see that um, that light blue there was actually tracking higher than it was in 2019, except for that little snow glitch in January. Uh, and then we see that yellow line just really plummet right away and get to a bottom there in April, like I mentioned. You can see that very slight recovery I talked about um, for the next couple of weeks, and then it really does level off. And I think it's it's interesting to note out that um, these are all uh, weeks of the year and they include seven days. And we're currently sitting at, um, <laughs> sorry, we're currently sitting actually below um, a 2014 Christmas week. So that's um, pretty low as far as ridership goes. Next slide. So this is uh, looking at how our different types of service have changed from 2019 to 2020. And so this really speaks to uh, that commuter change that I was speaking of earlier. Those top three uh, bars that you see are all commuter services, our downtown Seattle, University, and then our trips to Boeing. Those ones were hit our hardest um, uh, during this year. And then we have our kind of local service, feeder, corridor-based and rural, and all the way at the bottom at that 7% um, decline, we have that BRT service. So like I said, pretty resilient. Uh, next slide, please. So going into Vanpool, uh, this is uh, again by quarters with quarter one on the bottom. Vanpool had experienced a 16% decline uh, the first quarter, and then uh, that also had the lowest ridership month in April, which was in quarter two, uh, which brought it down 74% from the previous year. And it has had a, a slight recovery in quarter three at 70%. Um, it is a little bit more variable than what we're seeing in fixed route. We're not really sure which, which way it's going yet. So that's, um, we don't have that consistent line yet. So we'll see what happens there. Next slide. And here's Vanpool by day type. And this is very similar to fixed route. You have uh, most of our um, percent change or reduction in ridership occurred on weekdays. And that's again, because most of our Vanpool uh, customers are really using their van pools to get to and from work, they're commuter based. So and there's not really a lot of ridership that happens on the weekends, as you can see in that chart on the right, not a lot of numbers happening there anyway. Uh, next slide. And last, we're looking at DART here. Um, I mentioned previously that DART had the highest um, percent decline from 2019 to 2020. And they had already experienced, that service had already experienced a 20% decline in the first quarter was hit very hard in quarter two at an 84% decline. And then again, that slight recovery that we're seeing in all of our services uh, was only 74% down uh, in quarter three. Next slide. And by day type, uh, we see a pretty consistent uh, reduction in ridership across all the day types. And that's really just the type of service that's offered. Um, a lot of this is you know, getting errands, um, more of essential um, locations that you're going to. It's not really that that going to work and back uh, ridership. So all day types were down about 60% from 2019 numbers. Next slide. So last, I just wanted to walk through a regional comparison. How uh, does community transit look compared to other agencies in Washington? And I just wanna note that this isn't all the agencies in Washington. These are all the agencies that I was able to get data from the national transit database for. So if you see somebody missing, uh, that's most likely why. Next slide. So this is percent change of 2019 to 2020. And here we're just looking January through August. I don't have the September numbers yet. So a slight difference from the rest of the presentation. And for fixed route, we see that community transit is a little bit lower than the average. On average in Washington, it looks like we're about a 49% decline for fixed route service. Um, and community transit is at that 43%. So a couple of percentage points um, lower or higher, whichever way you think about it. Uh, sound Transit appears to have had the most um, decline in ridership at 62%. And let's see, King County Metro was at 53% decline and Everett Transit at 52% decline. Next slide. Here is Vanpool percent change for the same time period. And the average for the region was around 49% decline. Community Transit was a little bit higher than the average, but not too much. And Yakima Transit appears to have had a 79% decline during that time, while Intercity Transit uh, had the lowest amount of loss. Next slide. 
And lastly, DART. Uh, as I said previously, our DART service actually had a very large um, reduction in ridership and community transit was higher than the average, which sat around 45% for the region. Community transit sat at about a 60% decline. And next slide. I just wanted to summarize overall that um, community transit fixed route service um, has seen this consistent increase in ridership every year um, from 2014 through 2019 and was on track to continue that in 2020. Uh, but the pandemic hit and we see an overall 44% 40 decline so far for this year because of that. And overall in the region, uh, fixed route and van pool are right about average with everybody else. Um, DART is looking a little bit harder hit in our region um, than other areas. And so with that, I will thank you for sitting through my plethora of numbers and uh, have a good day. Thank you, Olivia. Appreciate it very much. And that gets us uh, to our committee reports. I'll start with the executive committee, which met on Thursday, the 15th of October with myself, council member Daughtry, council member Wright. The CEO provided his report and staff uh, presented a proposed revision uh, to our, the version that we use for our board meeting agendas. And we requested that it be used for our November board meeting, which you see. Updates included formatting uh, enhancements for an easy to read layout and links to corresponding documents in the packet, which I think are really helpful. I would like to thank staff for continuing to look for ways to support the board and the public as pertains to public meetings. So great work on that. The next regularly scheduled executive meeting is November 19th at 11.30 in the morning. And with that, I'll go over to Council Member Schwede for finance, performance and oversight. Okay. <clears throat> the Finance, Performance and Oversight Committee met on Thursday, October 15, 2020 via Zoom. Tom Merrill, Nate Nearing, and I attended. On the consent, consent agenda is approval for September 2020 expenditures and payroll items C through G. Uh, action item agenda is award of transit police unit contract for 2021 to 2023. Uh, Jacob Pelter briefed the committee on this contract for law enforcement services on community transit coaches and property. The contract decreases the transit police unit from 19.5 to 18.5 FTEs. Cost is $3,106,357 for the first year of the three-year contract. Uh, the committee recommended approval. Um, on the 2021 proposed budget, Mary Albert presented the 2021 budget, which you reviewed at the October 22nd quarterly workshop. After reading the 2021 budget notebook and possible hearing from your constituents, you may have questions. Please submit your questions to Mary Albert by Friday, November the 13th. The finance staff will answer your questions in a document that will be provided to you on November 19th, the date of the November Finance Performance and Oversight Committee meeting. Uh, report, uh, third quarter 2020 transit police report. Uh, Lieutenant David Bowman reviewed the third quarter transit police report. A copy is included in your packet. September 2020 sales tax report. This report reflects purchases made in July of 2020. In September 2020, Community Transit collected $14,185,953 in sales tax revenue, which is $652,142 more than budgeted. A copy is included in your packet. September 2020 diesel fuel report. Year to date through September 30th, 2020, community transit paid an average of $1.40 per gallon for diesel fuel. The 2020 budgeted amount is $2.25 per gallon, a positive variance of 85 cents per gallon. The next finance performance and oversight committee meeting is scheduled at 2 p.m. Thursday, November the 19th. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Schweddy. 
Council Member Wright, Strategic uh, Alignment and Capital Development. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the Strategic Alignment and Capital Development Committee was held remotely by Zoom Wednesday, October 21st, 2020 at 2 p.m. The meeting was attended by Labor Representative Lance Norton, Mayor Nicola Smith, and myself. Uh, the committee reviewed and forwarded two items to today's board meeting agenda. The first, Resolution 08-20, adopting the 2020 to 2025 Transit Development Plan. And the second item, approval of the September 2021 20, Northgate Station Service Plan. Planning and Development staff will present both items to the full board for action later this meeting. The committee also reviewed and forwarded one informational item to the, today's board meeting, which was the 2020 uh, third quarter ridership report, which Olivia Woods just presented to the board. Our next regularly scheduled meeting of the Strategic Alignment and Capital Development Committee is Wednesday, November 18th at 2 p.m. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Council Member Wright. That brings us to the consent agenda. Does anybody wish to pull any of these for further discussion? If not, we'll entertain a motion. I move approval of the consent agenda. Second. Moved by Council Member Wright, seconded by Council Member Dutcher. You approve consent. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you. That motion passes. Uh, action item first one is resolution 8.20, adopting the 2020 to 2025 transit development plan. Director Behe. Thank you. I wanted to introduce uh, Kate Turtolo. Kate's our planning project manager with leadership responsibility for organizing the annual update to our transit development plan. The COVID pandemic uh, presented some challenges for plan development this year, and Kate was able to capably guide this work in close coordination with finance and other supporting work groups. Uh, we'll be looking for action on the plan today, and while this is a, a routine part of our work program, it is a major effort in coordination with financial service, capital planning, um, and forecasting. Uh, to support implementation of what is approximately a one and a half billion dollar service and capital plan. I really want to thank Kate, um, Thomas Tamola, manager of planning and the entire team across the agency that supports preparation of the TDP update and advancing it um, for approval. And now uh, Kate will briefly summarize the plan and the recommended motion. Thank you, Roland, for that introduction. Before I go into the presentation, I just wanted to give you an overview of what is included in your packet. Uh, it's the board memorandum, which includes some background information, the status report, as well as the recommendation, and there are actually three attachments. The first is a link to the final 2020-2025 Transit Development Plan. The second is a summary of our outreach and the public comments, along with a copy of the three comments that we receive via email, and finally a copy of Resolution 08. Next slide, please. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, again, as, as Roland mentioned, this is uh, required by state law. We do it on an annual basis, and the transit development plan is very similar to jurisdictions' transportation improvement plans, which are also required. We saw early on that the COVID um, pandemic was going to impact the planning process. So we reached out to the Washington State Department of Transportation, requested and received approval for a two-month extension. Under normal circumstances, the board would be taking action in either August or September. The document provides a one-year look back, um, excuse me, it provides an overview of the agency. This is everything from our service area to our board makeup to the type of services we provide. It provides a one-year look back of our accomplishments, uh, a look at the current year planning projects, and then uh, a five-year look forward, including a financial plan. Community Transit also uses this document to implement our long-range plan that was adopted back in 2011, as well as providing guidance for our business planning and annual budget processes. And then just to briefly recap, this year, the process began in August with the introduction to the Strategic Alignment and Capital Development Committee. Then it was introduced to the full board at your September 3rd meeting. 
After this, our four-week public comment period actually uh, began with a press release. The comment period ended after the duly advertised public hearing held on October 1st, and then a recommendation was provided before the Strategic Alignment Capital Development Committee on October 21st, and then, of course, this afternoon we are hoping for action. Next slide, please. So our priorities have not changed. As highlighted in the first two bullets, we still are working towards providing easy access and connectivity to Link Light Rail, which you heard a little bit about earlier today. And we are looking to innovate and improve products, services that make travel easy and safe for all. To accomplish this, this plan includes increasing our bus service with connections to Link Light Rail in 2021, which you will hear about in a few moments as well as our planning to connect with Link at, at Linwood, Mount Lake Terrace, and in Shoreline in 2024. This plan also includes completion and launching of the orange bus rapid transit line, as well as the blue line extension in 2024. Both of these lines will connect with Link. This plan also includes beginning planning for what we're calling the gold line, which will connect the city of Everett to Arlington through the city of Marysville. We, uh, the plan also includes information about continued operation of DART and Vanpool services to meet customer demands. It also includes new initiatives such as our community programs, and this is um, being piloted right now in the city of Linwood and looks at alternative services such as first last mile connections. To implement this, we're continuing to look at investing in the employee experience, modernizing and expanding our base and facility to support the growth. And included in this plan is the continued completion or working to completion of our base, master, uh, base facility master plan, which includes uh, moving our, our headquarters to the Casino Road facility, changing uh, um, excuse me, modernizing and changing the facilities at Merrill Creek, adding on um, bays, and then finally refreshing our facilities at Cash Park. And then finally, this plan um, dealt with the curveball of the coronavirus. The plan includes some information about what we did early in 2021, excuse me, 2020, um, on protecting our employees, looking at our finances, and so that information is included in the plan as well. Next slide, please. So from a financial perspective, we are planning for the worst and really hoping for the best this year. And the plan that we've developed allows the ability to rapidly respond to changing conditions. Kind of highlighted in the bullets on the left, we began watching the changes of sales tax revenue when the um, pandemic first began in March. We adjusted our sales tax revenue assumptions and started looking at two different scenarios for recovery, which we're calling our guardrails, and that's the slow recovery and rapid recovery. I'll explain the graphic on the right in just a moment. Even with the slow recovery scenario where we're assuming sales tax recovery does not uh, rebound quickly, this plan, as Roland mentioned, includes just under $1.5 billion worth of service and capital projects, and it includes making sure our reserves are fully funded. So back up to the graphic on the right, this uh, is an illustration of our unrestricted cash what that means is the money left over for additional service and new projects after we have paid all of our bills. So the cost to operate our service, to complete our capital projects, and again, to fully fund our reserves. Bottom line, this financial plan is stable, sustainable, and continues to provide the ability for us to rapidly respond to the changing financial impacts or conditions due to the coronavirus. Next slide, please. So this slide illustrates, again, our major milestones. Although I wouldn't consider corona, coronavirus a milestone, it is important to explain that we have gone through ser uh, several service changes that we will be integrating with Link in, 20, or, yeah, at Link in 2021 at Northgate. 
in 2024 at Linwood, Mount Lake Terrace, and the 185th station in Shoreline. And we will be launching our Swift Orange Line and Blue Line extensions. The information on the left shows you we have, again, created these two scenarios based on our finances. In the slow recovery, we're looking about adding, and this is for bus service, we're looking at adding about 15,000 hours. In the rapid recovery, we're looking at about 110,000. What's not illustrated in here is the reinvestment of our service when we truncate in uh, 2024, and that will help us restructure our network to optimize service for the entire bus system. And this will um, help us, again, hit our priorities of providing rapid uh, connections to both local and regional transit services. Next slide, please. And then finally, as I mentioned at the beginning of this, your packets include a lot more detail on the public comments that we received, as well as the overview of all of our outreach. I did want to just expand a little bit on the comments that we received to give you a flavor of what was included for local bus service. This was a request for more service on the weekends, better uh, service to hard, hard ser excuse me, hard to serve locations such as Payne Field. It was also looking at extending our service day both in the morning and in the afternoon. There were also requests to improve our local bus stops to add shelters is an example. And then I also wanted to touch briefly on the last bullet, which asked about, um, we, we received comments from our writers who really wanted to understand more, what are we looking at for 2024? What is the criteria that we're using? Uh, do we have matri uh, metrics that we're trying to achieve? Are we achieving them? And on this last bullet, I'm very happy to report that we are beginning that planning work for 2024 internally and hopefully in mid-2021, we or mid to late 2021, we will begin our external stakeholder engagement and public outreach. Next slide, please. So that completes uh, my presentation. I'd like to hand it back to Mayor Nearing for action or if you have a, a, any questions. Thank you, Kate, for that. We appreciate it. And uh, is there any questions on this item? Okay. This would be uh, resolution 08-20, if anybody uh, wishes to make a motion. Mr. Chair, I'll move approval of resolution 0820, adopting the 2020 to 2025 transit development plan. We second it. Thank you. Uh, we have a motion. Did we have a second too? Yeah, Nicola did second. Mayor Smith seconded. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, motion and second. Any final discussion? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Next is the approval of the 2021 Northgate Station Service Plan. And again, Director Behe to introduce this. Thank you. Um, yes, I want to introduce uh, Sabina Araya, who's our manager of system planning. Sabina has primary responsibility for guiding the ongoing development and planning of our fixed route bus system. Um, Sabina will be recapping the framework of our proposed restructure of bus service in 2021 that will establish our first major connection to Sound Transit's Link Light Rail Network at Northgate Station. This is an exciting opportunity for early connection for um, residents of Snohomish County to Link, and we've been focused as an agency on um, really doing this well. We've had an extensive planning and public involvement process around this work in partnership with Sound Transit over the past two years. And we're now ready for board approval to move forward with implementation. Um, I want to thank Sabina, uh, Thomas Tamola, manager of planning, and the large team of planning, operations, communications staff 
that have collaborated on this work. And now I'll we'll hand it over to Sabina for the presentation. Thank you, Roland, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is an exciting step for us in planning connecting service to light rail, light rail um, at Northeast Station in 2021 when the four mile extension will be completed. Um, next, uh, Rachel. Thank you. Um, connecting to Northgate, as Roland mentioned, is an early opportunity for us uh, to offer um, that connection to Snohomish County travelers and have them have access to not only the um, UW district service, but to uh, downtown Seattle as well. It, it expands their service options uh, considerably. And it also offers an opportunity for us to improve the re reliability of the service and the efficiency of service. Um, and coordinating, coordinating that effort with um, our partner agencies to create a seamless regional system. Um, next. So we started our two-phase outreach process at the end of last year. It's been a long road. Um, in that first phase, we connected with our customers to better understand their needs, uh, to gather ideas, and get their initial feedback. And then we put together a proposal in the phase two um, and that we taking that into consideration what their what their concerns and um, feedback was and kicked off the second phase of outreach uh, with a presentation to the board in April and uh, concluding that um, phase with a public hearing on June uh, 4th. Next. Thank you. Um, the proposal included um, our 800 series route, and so it focused on the UW service. We did not propose that we um, terminate the 400 series downtown service, so we, we still maintain that connection direct. Uh, but we proposed that our 800 series route would be rerouted uh, to, Nor to Northgate Station uh, to connect with Link. And um, to reduce c customer wait time and improve travel operations, uh, the proposal offers m many more bus trips and a longer span of service. We wanted to make sure that people have more opportunities to connect, and that connection is seamless. Given that there would be frequent service offered by Sound Transit from Linwood Transit Center to connect to Northgate, we also propose to streamline the service from Linwood um, from Linwood and through Linwood Transit Center, um, we by replacing the existing Route uh, 855 service uh, with added trips on Route 81, which passes through um, Linwood, and that Route 810 would no longer serve the transit center. The proposal goal is to have 15-minute frequency for the CM peak for each route to ensure a smooth transfer from link to bus. Link service is very frequent, and morning transfers to Link should be fairly easy. However, in the afternoon, um, the customer experience depends on that wait time from uh, Link to the bus, and so bus frequency becomes um, more of a of a priority in the afternoon. So most of the trips that we are adding back is that um, in the PM time to ensure that transfer back is smooth. Next. So we came back in the phase two of, um, of the public engagement process with the same online open house format that we had in the first phase. Um, and we extended the 30 day comment period to 60 days due to COVID-19. And although in this second phase, our in-person outreach was very restricted by the pandemic, we had a robust online um, presence of we offered printed brochures on buses. We had social media campaigns and uh, news release and media coverage. We also sent out uh, stakeholder information packets to different jurisdictions. Next. So that effort, um, our online open house had more than 3,600 visits. We had a total of 511 survey responses with 300 write-in comments. We included the summary of the survey and feedback received in your packet today. 
And uh, since the outreach effort was a joint process with Sound Transit, you observed the feedback pertaining to both services to the entire proposal. For our portion, uh, to connect the 800 series to UW um, and uh, offer that connection at Northgate, we found that the majority of the UW district riders uh, felt the proposal met their needs. Um, we also found that many of the respondents that had been involved in the first phase had taken the first survey and they came back. Um, so that was great to see. We also reached new folks. And so that had more of a uh, generated new interest and um, made this effort more, more visible. Another aspect of the feedback that we found was important was that um, frequency is important to the majority of the respondents. Um, about 69% um, said that frequency is very important to them. So we took that into account as we kept evaluating our service options. Um, next. This brings us to where we are now. Uh, due to the uncertainty regarding the 2021 service levels, we had postponed a final decision on the proposed changes to the UW service to give us an opportunity to reassess our proposal. And though our, there's obviously still many unknowns going into 2021, uh, we have decided to maintain the level of service we had proposed in phase two um, in our outreach to ensure a successful experience for um, our current customers. Our proposal is consistent with the draft 2021 budget and the 2020-2025 TDP. We know this is a big change for both operations and our customers, so it requires planning and approval a bit earlier than our regular process in the spring. So there might be other elements of the service uh, being evaluated between now and then uh, that we'll come back to you uh, for in the spring. But this portion, we wanted to uh, make sure we plan and have enough time to implement it. This concludes my overview, and I'll return the screen over to Mayor Nearing for the action item or question. Great. Thank you for that presentation. And... Uh... With regards to the North Station service plan, are there any other questions or comments from anybody? Okay. Mr. Chair. Yeah, go ahead. I move that uh, we approve the transit September 2021 Northgate Station service plan for implementation at September 2021 service change. Second. Moved by Councilmember Daugherty, seconded by Councilmember Roberts. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. That motion passes. Thank you. Go ahead. Did we have another comment? Thank you. Uh, and thank you for staff for the work on that. And Sabina for the presentation. Final action item is the award of uh, transit police unit contract for 21 through 23. Uh, before staff presents this item, Snohomish County Council members Wright and Nearing will be stepping out of the meeting into a Zoom virtual breakout room to prevent any potential conflict of interest. Uh, when this item is complete, they'll return to the board meeting setting up a virtual breakout room, as you probably know from all these Zoom meetings, Brent can take just a minute or so. So we'll pause until the clerk confirms that this has been completed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Okay, it looks like they've been moved into the breakout room and we're ready to proceed, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Director Beardsley will now present this item. Thank you and good afternoon. Um, this, uh, no presentation with PowerPoint here. Uh, it's a pretty quick uh, summary of the action item coming from the Finance Committee. 
Um, it's a rather standard three-year contract. We have been fortunate enough to have a great working relationship with the Snohomish County Sheriff's Office since 2003, uh, 17 years of working with them as they help us to provide uh, for safety and security on our property, for our employees, for our customers. Um, so we renew that contract every three years. Um, I do want to acknowledge that we have on the phone uh, from, from uh, the Sheriff's Office, Lieutenant Bowman and Captain Rogers, uh, and then from our staff, Jacob Peltier and uh, Don Burr. We were uh, able to have a really uh, successful negotiation, not a, not a difficult one at all. I think that's evidence of, of the good relationship that we have to date. Um, so hoping you will approve this. And, and really what I wanted to just acknowledge is that this highlights for us some of our safety focus and the partnership we have with the county. Thank you, I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have them. Thank you. Any questions for? Jeffrey? I do have a question. Yeah. Um, and this is just kind of out of left field. Uh, this came about in my mind because of something that recently happened in Lake Stevens. Um, who else could we have gone out to for these services? We, um, well, so a couple of different things. We could have for the incorporated areas, we could be contracting, I suppose, with each of the jurisdictions. Um, but as you know, much of our uh, jurisdiction is within the county itself, and that's the sheriff's office. And in fact, some of the smaller jurisdictions also contract with the sheriff's office. Um, I do know that there are some other transit agencies that have contracted with a private service to deliver um, safety and security. We actually looked at that, not for this contract specifically, but three years ago when we were renewing the contract, we had a pretty sizable increase in the uh, manpower that we were um, funding through the contract. So we looked at private services and really felt like this is the best, uh, best way to go all, all the way around. Thank you, Jerry. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, we'll open the floor for any potential motion. Yeah, I'll make that motion uh, that the board of directors authorize the community transit executive officer to award the three year transit safety and protection services contract to Snohomish County Sheriff's Office in the amount of $9,601,440 with expenditure authorization for the first year included in the proposed 2021 budget. Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? Thank you. That motion passes. Uh, you. County Council members may now rejoin the meeting. We'll pause for the clerk uh, brings them back in and then we'll re, uh, re, re adjourn the meeting. I'm sorry, restart the meeting. All right, I received confirmation they've returned to the meeting chair. Thank you. And so uh, that ends the action portion of the agenda. And so with the chair's report, uh, we have a few items that we will discuss and, and some, some things we need to take care of. First of all, um, Puget Sound Regional Council representative alternate. Um, at the October board meeting, as you may remember, Council Member Dotry was selected as the primary Puget Sound Regional Council representative on the Transportation Policy, Policy Board. Today, we're looking to fill uh, the alternate role that he formerly occupied. So I'll start with saying, uh, is there anybody who uh, wishes to nominate somebody for that role? I'll nominate council member Schwetti if she will accept. Thank you. Uh, John, I'm yeah. already on the transportation board. I represent Snohomish County. Yeah. Sorry, I've been on it this year. <laughs> I mean, if I can serve as alternate too, 
I do go to all of them. <laughs> well, that's, I'm that's, not sure if they'd let you vote twice, but I knew you'd be perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Other people apparently already agreed with me, but. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank yeah, you, that's... Stephanie. <laughs> Absolutely. Was... Thank you. That was who I had in mind. So, uh, yes, yeah, CEO Heath. Yeah, I believe we did deal with this previously when uh, Council Member Todd was uh, covering two roles. Yeah. Um, we did check with the PSRC and it is allowable if that's your choice to have Jan serve yep. in two roles uh, on the transportation policy board. So if you're willing to Councilmember Schwede, I, I would concur with Councilmember Wright, you'd be perfect for the position. Are you willing to accept the nomination uh, with that clarification? Oh, sure. Not a problem. Like I say, I, I attend them all. I only missed on the uh, growth management board for six years on this one meeting and that was when we had snowmageddon around here <laughs> yeah excellent thank you um is there anybody else who wishes to nominate somebody okay well we'll go ahead then and vote uh all in favor of council member sweaty being selected as our alternate on the ps on this board aye aye, aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? It's unanimous. Congratulations. And yeah, thank, you. thank you. All right. With that, a uh, quick update on the CEO recruitment process. Um, as you know, applicants were encouraged to apply for this position by October the 23rd. The position received spectacular interest uh, with over 50 applicants to date. Uh, applicants came from the local area and from uh, one from out of the country in Canada. Although I'm not sure that person could get into the country now with COVID, but uh, no, we would, we would figure out a way. The position um, uh, will continue to be open until it is filled. And Keras Consulting uh, completed their initial interviews with applicants now and is finalizing a list of select candidates to present to the executive committee this month. That will actually take place, I believe, next Monday, next week, Monday. Uh, looking forward to that. From there, the exec committee will conduct round one of the interviews. Um, board and alternates will be together on Tuesday, December the 1st, when the board will conduct round two of the interviews with finalists. We're holding the afternoon, um, and we'll, we'll have a more final schedule for you once the number of final candidates are determined here later in November. The exec committee will be working with Keras Consulting and staff to arrange the details of the finalist interviews in this virtual environment, and uh, I'll send you an update once those details are finalized. Opportunities will also be offered to employees to meet with the finalists, so that'll be a good thing. And I wanted to thank you all in advance for the time and energy you will put into this important process. Uh, the month will go by quickly, and I'll be working with staff to keep you informed of the status and uh, the process along the way. I had an opportunity to briefly review uh, before this meeting um, some of the candidates we'll be looking at in the first round and it's very, very impressive. So uh, looking forward to the uh, remainder of the process. Uh, as shared in our October workshop, the December 3rd meeting will be Emmett's final meeting. That has gone by fast as well. Um, we will have some special recognition for him at this meeting. You may want to think of uh, some great stories, snide remarks or uh, uh, any, anything you would like, because that will probably be your final opportunity, at least in a, uh, in, in a setting like this. Um, we look forward to honoring Emmett uh, for his fine career here, and uh, I think December 3rd will be a very meaningful time, and uh, I know I'm personally looking forward to it, so uh, it'll be a great time to thank him for his service and send him on uh, in, in a great way. The date has also been confirmed for Emmett's virtual retirement party on December 16th at 3.30 p.m., which will provide you uh, an opportunity in that setting as well. And the board will receive more details in the coming weeks for that. Next board meeting is, uh, of course, the third on that date we just mentioned at 3 p.m. And that concludes my chair's report. And I neglected earlier in the meeting to give Emmett uh, a chance to do a CEO report. So I would like to insert that here, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, the, uh, the agenda was unavoidably full today, and that results in a pretty long meeting. And you've heard a lot of words today. So I'm going to abbreviate my report just a little bit. Um, I want to start with a quick COVID update. 
uh, within the past 10 days, we've had notification of a cluster of five positive tests. Um, interestingly, uh, none of the employees who tested positive were coach operators, uh, although all of them were members of the same department. Um, we have had we had zero uh, positive tests in August, two in September, two in early October, and then five here fairly recently. Um, it's it's possible that uh, a cluster of positive tests of that size could result in some interest from the media. So I wanted to be sure and inform you today of that uh, uh, event and also let you know we're, we're working very closely with the Snohomish Health District. And as a result of that uh, collaboration, we are fairly significantly expanding the COVID testing that we're, uh, we're having our employees participate in. So that's, uh, that's it on COVID. Operationally, um, Olivia covered ridership. I, I wanted to share with you from a policy perspective, um, our focus on addressing <clears throat> um, the decline in ridership uh, to the extent additional revenues may become available, we're gonna be focusing on putting service out in an effort to try to allow customers to continue to maintain social distancing on our buses. Um, ultimately, as ridership comes back, that is increasingly a challenge. But for as long as we can, uh, that will be a, a focus of ours. Uh, the second focus regarding um, ridership is going to be to make sure that we do a, a very high quality job implementing the Northgate service plan that Sabina shared with you earlier. Out in the community, Roland and I uh, were guests at the Mount Lake Terrace City Council meeting uh, recently, providing them an update on uh, project activity and COVID. I want to thank uh, Mayor Matsumoto Wright for inviting us and hosting us uh, at a, in a conversation with the MLT City Council. Legislatively, I want to congratulate um, our board alternate and County Council member Jared Mead on his reelection to the Snohomish County Council and therefore is, I, I would hope, his, his uh, continuation as an alternate on our board. Also on the election front, um, our congressional representation remains steady. We have cultivated very good relationships with Congresswoman Del Benny, Congressman Larson, and Congresswoman Jayapal, uh, all of whom will be uh, reelected, and we look forward to continuing our work with them. Uh, at a federal level, we'll, we'll wait and see how the House and Senate leadership shakes out and um, we'll report to you if, if that results in any change in our federal advocacy policy. Uh, on the state front, uh, the big news, kind of old news now, was the state Supreme Court overturning I-976 in its entirety. Uh, the good news is we did not receive car tab or motor vehicle uh, uh, funding. And so uh, we were not at risk uh, with I-976. The greater risk with I-976 was the potential loss of revenues to transportation benefit districts uh, and jurisdictions in our county who could lose revenue and therefore lose the ability to build uh, projects that have uh, joint advantage both for their jurisdictions and our transit services. So, um, and I had planned to give you an update on our facilities master plan. I'm just gonna remind you that our, that, that phrase facility master plan describes a, uh, a four phase, four year, $80 million project to expand the operating base and maintenance capacity to allow continued expansion of our system in the out years. Uh, I'll, today I'll just tell you that that project is proceeding on scope, on schedule, on budget, and uh, staff will continue to keep you informed of major milestones and progress as we move forward. Lastly, um, if you've served on the board for a long time, you may recall that our the radio system we used to stay in communication with our uh, coach operators in the field was reaching the end of its useful life. Initially, we budgeted $26 million to replace uh, that, that radio frequency land mobile radio system with the same kind of system, but a newer one. As we evaluated alternatives, we we determined that we could install a different kind of technology for about half the price, but it would take us longer to do that. So we extended the schedule on the project. Uh, I think we probably will complete that project for less than $15 million. 
So uh, something in the order of $13 million worth of, of savings from the original scope. I'm bringing it to your attention because for the past three years or so, every board packet has included a project performance scorecard um, reporting on the scope schedule and budget on that uh, $15 million project. We are so near completing that project that as of now, we'll be discontinuing that written report in your packet. Uh, Tim Crowbuck and his crew have been leading the implementation of the new wireless system and Tim will continue to report to you in the future as they uh, finalize uh, equipment installations and uh, startup of a new cellular based uh, radio system. I might add, not only did we do it for half the price, um, we, we expect uh, significantly better performance out of the cellular technology that Tim and his team were able to uh, engineer and implement. Lastly, I just wanna say our annual United Way campaign has wrapped up. Uh, we set a goal to collect uh, $25,000 in charitable contributions from our employees and we collected exactly on the nose, $25,000 that will be um, providing to United Way Snohomish County to continue their mission, uh, creating open roads to equity. And that completes my report for today. Happy to answer any questions you might have. Sorry, I'm done mute there. Uh, any questions for Emmett? Thank you for that report. Um, with that, we don't have any other business. There's no need of an executive session, correct? Okay. Correct. Yeah, correct. Okay. Very good. Then we will go to board communication. Um, Council Member Daughtry. I have nothing, thank you. Council Member Marine. Nothing. Thank you. Council Member Merrill. I have nothing, thank you. Council Member Nearing. Nothing to report, thank you. Thank you. Labor Representative Norton? Nothing, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Roberts? Just good to be back. Good to see you. Thank you. Council Member Sweaty? Uh, one really quick thing. Um, Monday yeah. night at Council, um, we approved to form a regional fire authority with North County, and that will be going to the voters in February. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Mayor Smith. I think Peter shared enough about my activities. <laughs> Nothing else, thanks. Thank you. Council Member Wright. Nothing to report, thank you. Great, thank you. Um, a meeting, uh, meeting today, uh, a lot of agenda items. Thank you all for your work on that. Staff, thank you for your great work in putting uh, this packet together and all the uh, work that went into everything involved here, including obviously the transit development plan and the Northgate service plan and, and everything else. Uh, a lot was accomplished and it was fun to do the Van Gogh uh, awards as well. And I think it was, uh, that's always a great, a great service to provide to the community. With that, uh, if, uh, we'll go ahead and adjourn. I know we'll see some of you next Monday, but if I don't see anybody else, happy Thanksgiving, uh, and we'll see you for sure on the next board meeting. Thanks, everybody.